Cool. So you can hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Yeah. So like Ken says, uh, I'm here to hopefully you give you guys a good summary and an update of what we've been up to um, uh, the last few years. And uh, being as most of you guys probably already know, this is year five of the closure on the Pemina River. And I wanted to talk to you guys and kind of give you guys a, an update. Um, I prepared a presentation. And in, in preparing the presentation, I, being that it's uh, year five, I, I kind of did a, a glance back at uh, 2015, probably. Uh, I, I pulled the presentation from when I talked to you guys, probably would have been 20, it would have been 2015, probably the first time I uh, proposed any kind of uh, closure on the Pemina to any general public would have been the time I, I talked to you guys. So I just went back at, just to make sure that uh, things that we were planning and saying that we were going to do back then, uh, see how they kind of jive with today. So I'll, uh, I'll load up the presentation here and uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. I'll, uh, I'll try to answer them. And uh, it, as long as we don't, we don't get bogged down too much, uh, I should be able to answer them on the fly. Uh, if not, I'll, I could also answer questions at the end. I, I'm hoping this stimulates discussion. This is uh Given that it's it's year five and we're moving into uh, a new new year next year, and this will be kind of the last year of data collection under this this current plan, uh, it's uh, any kind of feedback that we could receive now and throughout the year will be uh, greatly appreciated. Because um, this moving forward, this isn't a, a Mike Blackburn decision or a Fish and Wildlife decision. This is this is I'm hoping we uh, take into account things like. Uh, the biology, um, uh, social, and uh, of course, we always got to remember that things are will have political uh, sway too. So those three things are going to have to combine to come up with a plan moving forward. Uh, I think we have some pretty interesting data. Uh, of course, there's nothing that's going to be concrete saying the right answer. Otherwise, <laughs> this would be easy. But uh, yeah, with that, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can fire this up without too much of a hitch. Cool. Can you guys see my presentation right now? Yep, we can. Okay. I'll kind of look at this ripping. Okay, so so like I said, I went and pulled this slide from 2015, uh, and this was this was just kind of a the flavor of the day at the time. So this would have been 2015, where we still had catch and release regulations on. Uh, Arctic grayling in the Pemina, and they had been uh, catch and release for 11 years. Bull trout were, of course, catch and release. Mountain whitefish, uh, we, were, we were allowing five, five over 30. Uh, brook trout bag limit was two. And there's a few non native rainbows kicking around in there that are, are escaping from some of the pit lakes in, uh, in off Coal Valley Mine. So we see those on occasion, but we're letting people kill those. Um, why we had a size limit on, I don't know. I would expect we would let people kill all the rainbows in there. Um, but yeah, so basically what the objective of the time would have been was we were trying to cons uh, conserve a declining species while providing angling and harvest at the same time. So as you can imagine, if you have a, a species in a desperate need of recovery and we're allowing other people or other, other species to be harvested at the same time, uh, pressure might be an issue. So what we proposed at the time was our long-term goal was to, to see if we could provide a fishing opportunity uh, to, to anglers in the long-term uh, with a more of a short-term of a recovery of grayling populations. So kind of get it out of the, the, the poor state it's at to get it uh, to a less risk state. So perhaps one, a state where we could actually go and fish them again. Uh, and the proposal at the time was to go to a closure for five years to come back and check and, and monitor that regulation change over the five years. Uh, other things that we plan to do, let's see if we got it on here. Yep. This is a, the other slide from that previous presentation was, uh, so the next steps at the end of that slide presentation was we would, of course, we were, we were hoping to work uh, side by side with you guys, uh, doing temperature monitoring at the time, 
Uh, we were working together doing the, the movement study on the log jam. And then, of course, throughout uh, 2015, uh, we had to do the consultation. We did public meetings, online uh, consultation, and um, we had to do a First Nations consultation with, uh, at the time, I think it was uh, six different bands. Uh, so, so one of the other things is, although um, I work in fish management, I, I am only able to deal with anything regarded to fish and fish production. So uh, to get anything happening with on the landscape, we had to work with, with other folks like Public Lands, um, Forestry, and uh, the AER. Uh, the one thing I got bolded here that I, I had identified was uh, this one right here. So one of the things that we predicted that we would expect uh, if this experiment was gonna work is that uh, uh, evidence of recovering fishery, like, like grayling, we'd expect to see large older fish, increased relative abundance, uh, increased distribution, so just seeing fish in more places. And the last, uh, the cog in that wheel is once we start seeing those three or four things, we should start seeing increased recruitment as well. So I guess I keep that in mind in, when we're going through this presentation and uh, maybe your, your questions uh, will, will revolve around that because that's kind of what the aim was or the objective of the study. So looking back, just to set the stage a bit, back in 2002, 2003, there was a, a watershed assessment completed uh, by the ACA and based on those data, that's when Arctic grayling went catch and release in the entire watershed. Uh, previous to that, it was only catch and release, I believe, in Dismal uh, and Rat Creek. But yes, so catch release since 2005. By 2011 was when we started having discussions uh, with, with folks like Ken and Jim, uh, where you guys uh, realized and noticed even without any help uh, that, hey man, something's going on in the Pemina we need to do something in the Pemina because grayling seem to be going away. So you guys got heavily involved as things like uh, bridge replace or row crossing fixes, uh, streamside revetments, and more recently uh, Ken's been doing some stuff with uh, with drone footage and, and and keeping an eye on forestry. So this bottom right one here is a real recent cut block that we're investigating right now. Uh, to make sure that they're sticking to the ground rules with regards to cutting uh, within the water body. So that this one down here is a, it's a cut block that seems to be encroaching on Dismal Creek. And right now that's in the hands of the forest officer to check that out. So it's, uh, like I said before, this is what I find uh, that's working really well. Uh, I guess I, I want to call it a partnership. I don't know. But uh, work, working with you guys is, is you guys are able to help maintain momentum. As long as you guys are involved, it helps me um, lever folks, my bosses and, and ministers and stuff to, to, to keep a light on things like the Pemina and not get swayed to things, all things walleye and pike. So I just want to say thanks for that because that's without your guys' help, I, I would be probably still spitting in the mud. So by 2014, uh, we finally got some funding to, to help you guys in the Pemina and folks like uh, Colton on this call, we went out there and started sampling fish. And so there was backpack electrofishing and angling. And here's this map just identifies the places that uh, we went in 2014 to kind of get an idea of what we're looking at with regards to uh, uh, Arctic grayling. I almost said Athabasca rainbow, but that was a different meeting. Uh, so after we seen those data, uh, we we seen we deemed that the population was at very high risk. So back in 2003, we we seen it was pretty high risk. And looking back now, uh, if I would have seen those data in 2003 uh, at this day and age, I would I would have called it very high risk back then. So uh, this is this was. I would say pretty dire straits for grayling in the Pemina River. Uh, 2015, we did the the traveling road show. So we went and visited folks like yourself, um, Alberta Energy Regulator, Forestry, Environment Parks, um, all the First Nations groups, 
and told the story of the Pemina River and why we thought there was there's issues with the Pemina River and uh, what we thought a potential fix could be. So by 2016, uh, the angling closure was approved by the minister's office and lo and behold, uh, we have a watershed closure, first of its kind at that scale in Alberta ever. So in 2016, we were able to get some more money for to do the sampling on the main stem. So prior to 2016, all of our sampling had been done uh, in the tributaries with electrofishing. So get an idea what's in the tributaries and then also angling on the main stem. So by adding the electrofishing uh, work on the main stem using the raft, we were able to get things like uh, community composition, uh, community density, so all fish. And also we were thinking uh, given a closure, uh, we'd want to collect as much data as we can to uh, give us the best best available amount of data so that we could make a, a good decision moving forward. And of course, in 2016, we continue to engage with uh, land use regulators as they're the ones that hold the stick with what goes on on the land. Uh, one of the early, early kind of wins that we had, uh, prior, it was it would have been early 2015 by 2016 in our discussions with regulators, Alberta Environment Parks, now and AER, uh, discussing things like water withdrawals and how they could be bad for fish. Uh, we were actually able to get Alberta Energy Regulator and Environment Parks to to actually elevate water water withdrawal restrictions in places like Dismal Creek. So these are probably some of the highest uh, restrictions within the province. Sorry, Siri just answered me. Cool. So that was one of the one of the real early wins, uh, and and kind of made us feel pretty good moving forward with uh, with with regulators on the landscape when folks like uh, Alberta Energy Regulator and Parks were willing to get on board uh, right at the get go. Road stream crossings uh, timing was really good. Uh, for road stream crossings. Uh, in 2015, uh, a new directive was signed whereby the province is starting to look at road crossings in, in, in a real way, uh, working together with Foothill Stream Crossing Partnership and Alberta Energy Regulators and Environment Parks. This is a big stream crossing group. Uh, they started actually looking at crossings, getting inventories, and we were able to elevate the Pemina River as one of the highest watersheds of concern in the province at the time. And uh, now, since then, it is, is expanded across the entire province and is still considered one of the highest uh, watersheds for remediation of any kind of stream fragmentation with regards to hanging culverts. Uh, since I last talked to you, so uh, on this map here, this is just showing three different colors, uh, each one of these colors. So this light color here is identifying a forest management zone. Uh, I think this would be West Fraser. And then this kind of topi color is another forest management zone also by West Fraser. So I think this is Hinton Wood Products. Uh, this one in the middle here is Edson Wood Products. And uh, in the lower end here, this green one is Weyerhaeuser. Uh, the outline here is the Pemina River uh, watershed and recovery, recovery study area. Uh, since, since the closure was enacted, uh, I participated on on two forest management plans. So the ones with the arrow, arrows, so the lower and the midsections of the Pemina. So that includes uh, things like, um, this lower area will include things like Rat Creek, Mainstem Pemina down here, and then into Dismal Creek in here. Uh, so what we're able to do by doing this is, I, I sat in a room with um, senior foresters and, and the forestry companies where they actually, they, they provide us with their scenarios of how they're going to cut out to 200 years, and uh, which, which I find very interesting because I'm not, the, the plan is for 10 years. So I said, well, look, just show me what you're going to do for the next uh, uh, 10 to 50 years and really keying in on the next 10 to 20. And so when they show us their cuts, we were able to provide them with um, advice on this watershed that was similar to uh, or actually it's exactly the same advice that we give for Athabasca rainbows, which are considered endangered. So uh, we're 
we successfully got them to write this in their plan. So you could go to the Weyerhaeuser Pemina plan and find it. It is written up there that the Pemina River uh, rest recovery period with this map uh, identifying the Pemina as a, an area of, of interest or a, a high risk to fish where they have to do uh, reduce cutting within their watershed. So each one of these, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to point at the screen, that's not very helpful. So within the, within the Pemina watershed, they, they, broke it, they have broken it up into a bunch of smaller watersheds that make up the, the, the larger uh, Pemina common. And so in each one of those small watersheds, um, none of them are greater than 10,000 hectares. So pretty small pieces of, of landscape. And they have to, in their spatial harvest sequence where they model what they wanna cut over the next 200 years, uh, what we had told them was they could, not, uh, they could not cut one of those small watersheds more than 30%. And they were able to, I wanted to find that map. I got to find that map. I will show that to you guys next time. But they, it, they were able to actually put that in their their sequence at the very beginning, so that they wouldn't cut over 30% within the Pemina. Um, there might be some if they're the the actual wording was because so, some of them will already be over 30% from their last plan was um, not to go over 30% cut within those small watersheds. And if you're already over 30, you have to show. Uh, a dec declining trend within those watersheds over the next 10 to 20 years. So if they're already over 30, don't go cut in there. Uh, if they're under 30, they could cut up to 30% within a small watershed. Previously to that, there was um, no, no talk of fish in a forest management plan whatsoever in the Pemina River. Uh, things that they would consider would be cutting up to 50%, then they would consider mitigation after cutting 50% of a watershed or a small watershed. So I, I hope that's a big win. What we're noticing, um, you get it in the plan. It doesn't necessarily always translate down to the operational level or to um, the on the ground work. And so like I said in the, in the earlier slides, um, Ken was able to bring to our attention a cut block that, that may be encroaching on, on a riparian area or a buffer. Um, and in that case, the buffer required for Dismal Creek in that area is 60 meters. So right now they're investigating that and uh, we'll have to touch base back with them to, to see what happened because I'm, I'm quite curious actually. But uh, the forest officer, when, I, when Ken brought it to me, I brought it to the forest officer, uh, they're more than happy to go back and look. Uh, this, is, this is on their radar and uh, without forestry and folks like AER and stuff like that, getting landscape level things done or um, any kind of enforcement, uh, we need those guys to help us on the land. So that, that was the one of the bigger changes that's happened over the last two, three years. Now to the fun stuff. So fish monitoring. So what have we been doing? So uh, of course you guys know we've been uh, angling. So one of our methods we use is uh, sample angling. Uh, it's, it's a pretty effective method for detecting adults and sub-adult grayling. So we're talking fish that are anywhere from 20 centimeters up and we, we tend to catch uh, grayling as small as 15 centimeters and you catch the odd one maybe 10 centimeters, between 10 and 15 centimeters. But for the most part when we're catching grayling on, on flies and spinners or whatever we're using, uh, we're, we're usually talking fish greater than 15 centimeters. Uh, float electrofishing, uh, it's it's what we use on the, the main stem Pemina. It's, it's really good for giving us an idea of, of what lives there, all, all species, whereas angling is pretty much, we're pretty much targeting grayling and we, we, catch, we catch things like brook trout, um, the odd Mount whitefish, but for the most part, we're targeting grayling. Uh, so we're, we're not catching things like dace, uh, pike, walleye, things like that. We, we catch them we catch a few, but not, not like we would when we would do uh, float electrofishing. So float electrofishing also is effective method for monitoring mountain whitefish. Uh, the reason why we're interested in mountain whitefish is we think that with mountain whitefish in the river, because they were being harvested already, um, we have float electrofishing methods that are standardized and we're, we're able to monitor mountain whitefish really well with electrofishing. Uh, the response in Mount Whitefish to a fishing closure should be first and foremost and should be 
should start blinking before we see, say, uh, Arctic grayling blinkings, because Arctic grayling were so low, we would start, we should start to see them coming up with the closure, uh, but mount whitefish, because they have quite a few more fish, uh, the response should be quite quicker, quite a bit faster. Uh, backpack collector fishing, uh, we, we do this in the tributaries. Uh, it's same thing, it's, it's also a standardized method. Uh, we're able to get the small stream uh, community densities and it's, it's mainly effective for capturing young of the year or immature grayling. So the idea of doing the backpack collector fishing in the tributaries is to give us an idea of what we have for Arctic grayling recruitment, um, maybe give us some insight into what tributaries they're spawning in. So for example, if we start catching young of the year grayling while we're electrofishing, uh, that can help us uh, get an idea of where grayling potentially could be spawning. So we could start looking into those tributaries for, for other things like maybe um, remote site incubation or who knows. So that, those are the three main uh, methods that we're using. So just to give you an idea, here, this is a map of the Pemina River again. Uh, this is the last time we did the full meal deal on the Pemina River. So this is 2018. And so uh, the, these red circles here, if I get my pointer here, all these red circles, hopefully it's showing up red for you guys. These are all backpack electrofishing sites that we've completed. And these little blue triangles here, these are our electrofishing sites. Um, so for, to give you guys some orientation, this is the Wolf Lake Road crossing right here. So we've floated all the section past Dismal Creek all the way down to Patty Creek. And we've also floated from the Lovett River all the way down to the Sundance Bridge crossing here. Uh, these purple points here, these purple squares, these are all our angling sites that were completed in 2018. So when we do a full meal deal, it's, it's fairly extensive. Um, not quite as extensive as the, the first time we went out uh, in 2014, which would have included sampling throughout this section between, I think we had angling between um, Sundance Bridge Crossing and Wolf Creek. Uh, but in the interim, we, we kind of focused more in on the upper stretch for the angling where we, were look, where we started detecting grayling. Because uh, as you might remember, 2014, we only caught six grayling in the main stem uh, throughout the entire main stem. And I think they were only at three sites. So we, we tried to focus our efforts so that we uh, were efficient with our time and money. Uh, moving forward into this year, I'm, I'm hoping that I could expand that back out to what we did in 2014. So we come full circle. We could have a, a pretty interesting comparison from 2014 to what is it now, 2020. So uh, a little bit of a quick timeline, just to remind us. So 2014, we did the watershed assessment. So it was the full meal deal. We did uh, uh, tributary electrofishing, angling in Dismal Creek and the Pemina main stem. Uh, 2016 was the watershed closure. Uh, we, uh, but that first year of the watershed closure, we were able to do the main stem uh, raft electrofishing. So uh, our thinking was it was closed in 2016, but we shouldn't be seeing any results that first year because no one has, not, none of the fish have had a chance to, to spawn through or live through an entire year of a closure. Uh, 2018, we were able to do our second main stem electrofishing assessment and also the tributary electrofishing and uh, Pemina and Dismal Creek angling. So right now we're sitting at two data points for electrofishing on the main stem and the same thing for angling and tributary electrofishing. Uh, by 2019, the plan was to do the main stem electrofishing and angling. Uh, we were able to get the main stem electrofishing in, uh, but the angling, uh, we held off on it uh, because of some of the, the issues we we're having with, with the rain and stuff in August and July. So we were able to squeeze in the, the main stem stuff in between the high water, but we, we didn't think it would have been appropriate to do the angling in high water because our, our, our results would have been skewed. Our catchability in high dirty water probably would have gave us some, some poor results. So that's where we, that's what we've done so far. Uh, so, so although we weren't able to do any angling in 2019, I'm just gonna move this strip here so I can see. Okay, 
So, so this is, I, I've probably showed you this guy's, showed you guys this graph before. So this is Dismal Creek angling. Um, on the bottom here is the size of the fish. On the side is how many fish we catch per hour. So it gives us an idea of abundance based on catch rate. Uh, these gray bars are what we were catching in 2014, so pre-closure. Uh, and then in the third year of the closure are these purple bars. So what we're seeing is a difference in catch rate. Uh, we almost, we more than doubled the catch rate from one year to the next. And we're seeing uh, a mean, mean size getting bigger too. So if you think back to that original slide, or one of the original earlier slides, we talked about what were we looking for with regards to uh, recovery. Uh, so we're looking for more and bigger fish. Um, right now we're seeing some indications that maybe we're seeing that in Dismal Creek. Uh, break down Dismal Creek just a little bit more. So this is the same thing. We're still looking at catch rate per hour. Uh, these are just site IDs. So uh, I, I know they don't mean anything to you, but uh, what I'm saying here is at this end of the graph, this is upstream Dismal Creek. And when you get down here, this is downstream Dismal Creek. So downstream to the mouth. And same thing, 2014 is what we caught in, in Dismal Creek in, the, in, this, in these gray bars. And then the pink bars are what we caught in 2018. So uh, third year of the closure, we're looking at more fish at, at the sites and we're seeing uh, fish at more sites. So another thing that we're looking for. And when we break it down into mature and immature fish, uh, for the most part, we're still seeing mature fish. Uh, we're not seeing uh, a lot of indication of, of recruitment yet. Uh, so for just to look at this, compare this to our fish sustainability assessment. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is how we, we look at fish and evaluate fish. So same thing, it's still our Arctic railing per hour here. And I'm just comparing 2014 to 2018. Uh, this red bar just indicates very high risk and then high risk. Yellow bar is kind of moderate risk, kind of where, where we would like to actually have the Pemina River. And then the green is, is very low risk. So uh, an example of a very low risk or a low risk grayling fishery would be something like the Little Smoky. Uh, right now, when we look at this, uh, it appears that we have a, a bit of an increase or a pretty good increase in Dismal Creek, um, but uh, two dots does not a trend make. So we'll be looking to get at least that third dot out this year. Unfortunately, we didn't get the one last year, but uh, once, we, once we get the, the third data point in 2020, I'm hoping that we can have some semblance of a trend to give us an idea of what, what we're looking at for Dismal Creek. So let's look at the angling on the Pemina River. So Pemina River, uh, same thing. We're looking for more fish. Uh, we're looking for bigger fish and fish in more places. So uh, this is the same graph for Arctic grayling per hour and our sites are on the bottom. And so up 11, so we're talking, this is upstream Pemina River, upstream all the way or above the trunk road, all the way down to uh, Lodge Pole. So these little gray bars, there's one, two, three of them. Those are, those are our catch rates of, so we caught fish in 2014 and the pink ones are when we caught them in 2018. So we're catching more fish, we're catching in more sites. 2014, we're talking three out of 12 sites. So we're catching fish at twice as many sites. So that's a good indication of recovery. And when we look at the catch rate, it's an order of magnitude different. Uh, and same thing with uh, mean fish size, mean fish size is getting bigger as well. So these are all positive signs. Uh, looking back at one of, pulled another slide from when I talked to you guys in 2015. Uh, I think this is, this is the slide I, I called the, um, the patient on, uh, uh, on life support. So this is, we're still looking at angling data here. So catch rate per hour, uh, the size of fish. So 2013, or sorry, 2003, uh, when ACA did the work, this is an idea. So the higher the bar, the more fish of that size, uh, but this is not a very good distribution of fish. Um, catch rates were really low and, and, and pretty sparse. By 2014, this is where we got these few little blips. Like I said, we caught very, very few fish in 2014 in the main stem. And uh, so th this is why I said that the patient was on life support, uh, but because of the, 
the source that we had in Dismal Creek, uh, I, I thought that maybe we could we could move forward with some sort of recovery program on this. When we look at compare it now to 2018 on the main stem Pemina, now we're seeing uh, a semblance of a, a much sturdier size distribution. So, uh, and like we said, or like we were hoping, is that um, we'd see more bigger fish. So we're, we, we don't have any indication of any of the recruitment in here, uh, but these are angling data, so I wouldn't expect to see them really into here. Like I said, things over 15 or 15 or 150 millimeters where we'd start detecting with angling, but even still, we're still not seeing those in the Pemina. Uh, but these, these to me are positive and encouraging results. Uh, similarly, we compared this to our uh, fish sustainability assessment. And although these are, the Pemina River is still considered very high risk, um, uh, if you look at the catch rates, it's an order of magnitude difference. So in 2014, we're looking at fishing 100 hours to catch three grayling. And in 2018, we're looking at fishing uh, on average 10 hours to catch three grayling. So uh, in, in, in my mind, that's a very different number. Um, but also keeping in mind, these are only two data points. So uh, caution in the interpretation, we need to catch, we need to collect at least one more data to get any semblance of some sort of trend. But so far, um, what I've shown so far, everything is, seems to be moving in the right direction. Just to put this in perspective, so um, uh, prior to doing any of this work on the PEMNA, we're looking back on, on anecdotal data, um, old file data, whatever we could find to get an idea of what the PEMNA used to look like. Uh, we talked to folks like uh, Jim O'Neill, guys that actually were able to fish the, uh, the Pemina River in the 70s and, and, and before the 70s. And so what we were able to come up with, with it was an estimate of about one fish per hour uh, was a pretty good number. It could have been higher, it could have been lower, but on, on average, one fish per hour was, was considered pretty good in the Pemina, and that would put it in a pretty low risk state. Um, in 2003, when the ACA did the work, we, we were we were down quite a bit, so we we're talking more to one fish, or sorry, one fish every ten hours. So, um, over whatever how many years say that is thirty some years, uh, it declined quite a bit, and that's kind of why uh, you guys and and we kind of got involved. And so during that during that time period, we were harvesting probably all fish in the Pemina, and including Arctic grayling. Uh, between 2004 and 2015, though, um, the watershed was in catch release, and we still we were still getting declines. Um, so we think this is a cumulative thing. So the plan was because it was so low, was try to affect many, many things we can to help grayling come back. Um, within three years of a closure, uh, we're we're seeing some pretty stark um, movement, at least in the catch rate in 2018. Um, of course, uh, all of our hope is that line keeps going up. Um, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic though, but just to show um, that this, hopefully this is kind of jump-starting the, the recovery on the Pemina. Rafting. So this is just a, a, a picture of our study design. So. We had identified 35 sites throughout the main stem that we were going to electrofish using our raft. Um, um, because of logistical reasons and some of this water, I'm sure you guys have tried fishing some of this water in here. It gets very, very shallow and um, at most times of the year when water conditions are good for electrofishing, uh, they're not good to get the raft through there. So we have been sampling from the trunk road here, site number one, down, this is Sundance Road Crossing here at 13, and then also um, the Wolf Lake Road down to 2018. We stopped here, but for for all the other night sites, we we went all the way down to the Lodge Bowl Road. So what does that look like? So um, we're actually we have three points: uh, 2016, 2018, and 2019 using the raft data. Um, basically, this is this is just showing mountain whitefish. Uh, like we said, this is kind of the species that's going to give us early indications of, of how the, the experiment on the closure is working uh, for fish. And so 
2016 is the gray bars, 2018 is the blue bars, and the most recent data, 2019, that we have is red. And basically what we're seeing here is in a three-year period, our catch rate seems to be increasing. Uh, our mean size is bigger, so we're getting more bigger fish. And this, you can see this indicated here in these, these bars getting elevated above of all the other data. So also a positive sign moving forward for the PEMINA. Maybe I'll just back up here, here one thing. I don't have a slide in here, um, but um, one of the things that we're also paying attention to with regards to mountain whitefish in the Pemina River is um, in developing the fish sustainability index for mountain whitefish, we collected all the data, um, uh, present, past, and uh, things like that what we also consider are things like genetics. And so we've done genetic comparisons on Mount Whitefish between the Pemina and a bunch of other watersheds like uh, the Athabasca proper, um, Sequatama, a bunch of tributaries that flow into the Athabasca upstream of the Pemina River. And what we're finding is that Pemina River is coming out as quite a bit different than every other Mount Whitefish fishery within the Mount within the Athabasca drainage, and that which suggests that this 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 population of mountain whitefish might be a bit different genetically. Um, therefore, we, we are paying close attention to maintaining this, this fishery as well. Uh, so mountain whitefish. So this is, so we're looking at mature mountain whitefish here. Uh, this is the catch rate of mountain whitefish using our raft electrofisher. And again, we're using just the scale of red being high risk very high risk to green being very low risk. So really, really good fishing for uh, good abundances. And, and same thing, we're, we're seeing uh, a bit of a trend here moving upwards and potentially uh, moving a risk category from very high risk to, to high risk. Uh, so th th these are all, all good signs. Uh, similarly, this is uh, just a, a plot showing uh, Mount Whitefish per kilometer here. And this is one through 35 on the bottom. So this is our sites upstream. So from uh, at the Lovett Confluence all the way down to 35 at the Trunk Road and showing the data throughout time. So the gray bars, 2016, 2018 blue, and the more recent stuff, the red ones. Uh, what we're noticing is the red bars are starting to get up. Each site is, it appears that each site is, is increasing. Uh, throughout the watershed, it's not one site that's driving it. And, and what of note is really interesting is once we get below the Wolf Lake Road, we're kind of getting into, like as you guys know, you, you've been deploying uh, the temperature data loggers down there. We're getting into more warmer water, uh, more kind of a pike walleye kind of system. And even, so it's more of a more fringe water for mountain whitefish. And because we, we didn't sample the stuff in between, uh, we've actually created a potential to analyze this using um, stratifying it into kind of an upper and lower section and and likewise uh, the community composition has looks like it's it's a good way to look at it too whereas the upstream uh, we could call it say more desired habitat for mountain whitefish and similarly arctic grayling and downstream is uh, less desired be it because it's warm or whatever so if we look at it uh, Looking at the upstream and we compare it to our uh, fish sustainability index, uh, we're seeing almost doubling of uh, densities of Mount Whitefish up, up, sorry, upstream. And similarly, when you look downstream, uh, we have a trend up, upwards in the fringe habitat, or what I'm calling the fringe habitat right now, which is really, really, um, I, I find it really cool. So. Um, when, when you have a fish recovering, uh, typically what you see when, when they're in dire straits is they, they start to increase their abundances in the really, really good habitats. So I think that's what we're seeing in Dismal Creek. We're seeing uh, fish numbers increasing in Dismal Creek. Fish really, really want to live in Dismal Creek. And then a few sites on the Pemina. Uh, with Mountain Whitefish, they weren't in dire straits. They, they, it looks like they were sitting in kind of a high risk, not not at the bottom rung. Uh, so when we start seeing them increase in abundance, they start spreading out into the moderate habitats, into the fringe habitats. And I think that's what we're seeing downstream. So we're seeing 
although it looks like uh, like a small slope of the line, if I can find my mouse. So in this bottom graph here, looks like a small slope and very small number and high risk. Um, but that's to be expected once we get kind of in the fringe habitat. What I'm looking at is we, this trend is going from zero point something to two. So this, this is a really actually a relatively a, a pretty big increase in um, mountain whitefish in those lower pieces. Uh, some of the other things we were, we were doing were uh, non-compliance cameras as well as you guys. Um, we weren't able to get uh, cameras out last year um, due to a lot of things, and uh, mostly money and people. Uh, however, when we were out there, we were still seeing non-compliance. Uh, we've seen your guys' cameras. Uh, there's still non-compliance going on. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do with this uh, is I was able to take your guys' data and my data and prove um, build a brief and provide it to enforcement staff and I presented these data to all of the officers that are within the region that I manage so folks from Drayton, Edson, Hinton, Whitecourt and uh, and their bosses so superintendents as well and they found this data very telling uh, so this is just showing this map is showing uh, the shaded in area is the Pemina River uh, anything that is coded red, whether it be a star or a circle, is where we have identified folks in non-compliance, uh, which basically is saying we got pictures of people fishing in the closed areas. And uh, where we had stars is where I identified areas of the highest non-compliance and where I, said, I asked officers if they're going to go to the Pemina or if they're going to go check fishermen, uh, please check these spots first. And so uh, this was pretty well received by officers. Um, but far as I know, uh, I don't know of any charges that have happened in the Pemina yet. So, but, and, and we're still seeing people fishing. I have examples of uh, one guy fishing as we're driving by, we stopped and pulled over and told him it was closed. And he, and he proceeded to say, I don't know, even though he was standing next to the sign and we said, the sign's right beside you. And then he finally realized and packed up and went away. But so um, I, I find it pretty hard to plead ignorance when you're standing next to the sign. But so we're still seeing that. Uh, the good news is, is I guess we're still see, we're seeing positive results, even though we know there's some non-compliance going on. So what are we planning to do? So this year is kind of a weird year, uh, <laughs> to say the least. The plan is to. Uh, we're, we're going to get our data loggers out this year. Um, we're going to get our remote cameras out. None of those are out yet. Uh, we have some staff now. Uh, I've officially been allowed to go work in the field as of June 1st. So we, we were not allowed to work in the field yet um, because, of, uh, because of COVID. Um, but the plan is we, we will get the angling stuff done uh, as long as we don't get totally rained out, but that, that'll be our number one priority because angling is something that we can do and uh, mitigate any kind of uh, risk of COVID. It's, that, that's a pretty easy one. Float electrofishing has been a bit of a question mark. Um, this requires two sweaty people at the front of a boat rubbing shoulders uh, digging for fish. So um, uh, the health, uh, uh, Dr. Hinshaw probably would, would not like wouldn't consider that social distancing, but things seem to be lightening up a little bit. And so I'm pushing pretty hard uh, to, to see if we could get that done this year, uh, hoping that flows hold off till uh, end of July, August. By then, we'll have a pretty good idea whether or not we'll be allowed to do that or not. Uh, the plan was also to electrofish the tributaries um, uh, because of COVID and um, with our funding cycle and hiring cycle. Uh, so far, we, we were unsuccessful in getting any kind of answers on funding and, uh, and hiring manpower obviously has proven to be interesting with, re with COVID. So right now, we don't have uh, a concrete plan to get any of the electric fishing done. However, I, I'm, I'm keeping this on the list and hoping that we can pull off the angling and the float electric fishing. Uh, I'll dig deep into our permanent staff and volunteers to get things like angling done and the permit staff to get things like float electrofishing done 
and um, hoping we get that all all completed uh, in July and early August. And if that if everything works out, then hopefully we'll have some um, people and money left, and we will tackle some of those electrofishing uh, tributaries in August, which could be really really good timing anyway. So once flows are low in August, um, and uh, it's given uh, young grayling time to grow so uh, it's easier to detect young of the year grayling in August as opposed to say July because they're actually uh, they start swimming around and they're getting into the kind of anywhere from 70 to 90 or 100 millimeters so they're they're easily detected with uh, with the electro fisher if they're there so uh, August is a good time to look for that uh, also this year we're, so we're, we'll be exploring potential restoration recovery options. So things like um, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to add and, and get more funding and people to do is to start looking at potential donor populations. So uh, if we if we decide to move forward um, into uh, continuing recovery actions and potential restoration actions in the Pemina River in say year six, um, I, we have an idea that that we have some fish in Rat Creek, we have fish in Dismal Creek, uh, but I'd like to further look into uh, uh, tributaries like Rat Creek. We have some data, but we don't have an entire watershed distribution on that for densities. And same things like um, other ones that are come up are things like Nelson Creek. So uh, getting in there and getting a better idea of, of what the potential is there for uh, maybe things like uh, egg takes or fish transfers or just getting an idea of, of what what our options are uh, same thing with restoration watershed sites so uh, what that means is if if we were able to do anything um, any kind of restoration efforts with regards to remote site incubation or fish transfer or anything where would we do these uh, so that that will require some some field visits um, more literature search and uh, and also with re regards to this third point here international collaboration uh, learning from other other jurisdictions such as folks from Montana perhaps Michigan as to what they've done and, and, and how they've started restoring populations there's actually uh, grayling populations uh, in the United States say that are in way worse shape than Pemina River and and they're well on their way with regards to uh, restoration and um, fish transfers and remote site incubation. So um, as some of you guys probably know, uh, the plant we had planned earlier this season in May to to conduct a workshop with folks from uh, Montana and throughout the, uh, Alberta to start talking about uh, potential restoration uh, actions and uh, things we've done in the past and kind of put our brains together on, on how these things can be applied in Alberta. Uh, and of course that got um, put on a hard pause because of COVID, but we're looking to get that sparked up again come um, this fall, hoping that we can uh, get our our guest speaker from uh, Montana could come up and borders are open again in fall. We'll see what happens there. Uh, and of course, uh, throughout this this five year, we're, we're looking to get uh, get our, the results that we need to make uh, good decisions. Uh, so uh, at the end of this year and throughout this year, uh, the plan is to engage with stakeholders, to discuss potential management options, um, potential trade-offs, and, and seek feedback from, from stakeholders. Uh, so this, this I'm, I'm hoping that this can happen throughout the year, uh, but I anticipate we'll also, it'll probably be, um, uh, mainly focused in towards the end of the, the the summer, so fall and winter. Once we have the fifth year, so that we can make better decisions uh, moving forward on on what we want to do uh, in the Pemba River. So that that when I say stakeholders, that'll include um, folks like yourself, uh, general public, and of course uh, First Nations and Métis. And that's what I have for an update. Um, I'm just gonna move this so I could see who I'm talking to. If you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to to answer them. So right now, everybody's on mute. If you uh, if you do have a question, just unmute yourself. The button's down on the bottom left side of the screen, usually. 
uh, just unmute and uh, fire away. Hey Mike, is this going to lead to another like extended closure on the Pemina, or do you think it's enough data to, for that to happen? Or do you think they're just going to you're going to open it up and then that's and just kind of collect data from there? Well, I, I I think we need to collect the data. Um, so we ha we have the start of a trend on the main stem, uh, the angling data on Dismal Creek, and um, the angling data on the Pemina. Where we, we still haven't really have an established trend. Things look positive. Uh, I, I say we we collect the data and we discuss the options after year five. Uh, I have ideas of what we think we should do um but like i said this isn't uh this isn't a mike decision on the Pemina river this, yeah. this is an everyone decision um it, so for example if we make decisions to say yep uh we we spark this recovery let, let's kick it back to catch and release or to some sort of harvest um that that'll be that'll be tricky uh i think um that we will have to discuss that as a trade off as to if, if that's the plan, that's fine. Uh, but we, I, I'm not sure if that would be the right method for uh, recovery in any of our lifetimes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, 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 we would just have to discuss the trade offs. Um, do I say we close it for five years? I don't know. Um, it, it's an option if we're planning on doing any kind of uh, fish transfer or remote site incubation. Uh, I don't think it would be wise to have people angling uh, as we're we're moving fish and um, and trying to recover any kind of recruitment in any watersheds. So what that looks like with regards to watershed closure or smaller closures or um, any kind of perhaps um, reduced angling efforts, similar to things like uh, uh, what's called reduced effort like like they do in BC or like I, I, I'm trying to entertain all options um, as long as we're we're looking to recover the population so and and if we're not we just got to be explicit that we're not planning to recover the population uh, we want this to be a recreational angling opportunity and we, we just got to be honest in what we're going to do yeah thanks yep you stated there was a uh, uh, a bit of excitement about the information for the uh, for the wildlife officers as far as the non-compliance but do you think there's a reluctance on their part to move ahead with uh, uh, tackling those guys I don't think there's reluctance um, I think um, it, it, it can be really difficult to find folks in non-compliance on the river it's not like a lake where you could spot them a long ways away uh, it's a long drive down there They've, they've mentioned to me a few times that even if folks are seeing them, there's limited cell service. So people, they're not even getting reported poacher calls from down there. Uh, uh, and it's just <laughs> uh, officers, uh, they, they have to, get, they actually have to go enforce things. Uh, I, th I think there's pressure on them to actually make bus, right? So for them to drive down to the Pemina and not encounter a person, it, until every fifth or sixth visit. I, I think that's hard for them. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to work with them and provide them with the best yeah. information so that they have, they know where to go to have the highest probability of actually running into someone fishing. Okay, there's no, there's no restrictions on gasoline or, or that kind of thing. No, them. not that I know of. Um, and now we, we have uh, three officers in Edson. So before that, there was only two. Um, I'm not sure what's so Edson are the guys that patrol down there. Uh, so we're finding that they're they're finding a lot of non-compliance in the pit lakes down there. So uh, they're they're learning that it's bang for their buck to go down there and look at the Pemina and also because they could see if anyone's in the pit lake, so they have to park their trucks and walk in. So as soon as they see vehicles in there, uh, they know that they have people to check. So. Uh, I, I'm just trying to sweeten it, the pot for them as much as possible so that they they feel like they should go down there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Mike. Yep. Peter. Um, hey, Peter. Two questions for you. One, one um, has there been testing on the upper permanent for a disease, whirling disease? 
I'm trying to think. I, I want to say yes, um, but I'm thinking. I'm not. I'm thinking maybe no. Uh, you're thinking with regards to grayling. Yeah. Well, and and the, it it affects. It could affect grayling, right? But also it can. Yeah, it's less likely on grayling though. Uh, it's would, more so. Would white fish though. Yeah, perhaps mount whitefish, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, second question is, I, I don't fully understand, maybe you can help me out with this, the process for uh, making the recommendation for, for next year on uh, closure, closure you know, whatever. At what point do you need to, or do you have to make some sort of a final recommendation who does that go to? Where does it go from there? So my understanding would be we would uh, look at the data, uh, analyze it. Um, I, I, I would work with my peers and come up with uh, potential options and recommendations and what those would mean with regards to recovery or, or potential trade-offs uh, using different scenarios. And we would engage with public and First Nations and get that feedback. And it, eventually that goes up to, through the, uh, would be my f the Fish and Wildlife Director and up to the Minister's Office. And the final decision actually gets made at the Minister's Office. Okay. Yep. And that will be need to be made by when February, by next, February next year? <laughs> so it, it would need to be made sometime prior to April 1st of next year. Okay. I, <clears throat> I cannot uh, predict when the Minister's Office makes any decisions. Okay, thanks. Yep. So similar to like, and, and I'm just going off of, of what we've seen in the past and more so recently with regards to uh, some of the stuff with, with uh, walleye and pike. So the regulations that went forward uh, this year, we, we went and did engagements across, I think, 11 different venues across the province uh, to discuss walleye and pike regulations and uh, moving forward on enhanced harvest and stuff like that. Uh, I would see that as similar for the Pemina. Uh, I don't know if that would be part and parcel with a, uh, a roadshow on walleye and pike. I would hope not. I would think that this, this would uh, garner its own, um, own audience that would want to talk about this sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how I have it envisioned uh, to try to, to get the collective mindset together and, uh, and work on a path forward. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, folks as yourselves and, and this group that's been working in the Pemina in 2011, seeing some positive results uh, that we probably aren't looking to throw the baby out with the bathwater yet. Why do you think the 2018 data for the whitefish was kind of lower than? 2018. Oh, so 2018 data. So we had, yes. So that, what happened in 2018 is we had a really, really high water event and we went, we went and sampled right after that. Uh, we think that might've had something to do with catch rates in 2018. I could, let's see what I could find, find it here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Cause we've seen it uh, not just with white fish, we've seen it with all fish. If I can present. Share screen. It didn't look as bad for the grayling, though. Well, the grayling we weren't catching with electrofishing; we were catching with angling. Oh, so okay. we wouldn't have seen it. So, 2018. So, can you guys see my screen right now? Yeah. Okay. So here, I'll just go from. I'll make it bigger here. So uh, sites, and and it was only in sites four to thirteen where we noticed uh, less fish in 2018. And so this spiked from uh, 50 cubic meters per second to over 200 cubic meters per second, and then dropped really fast. And, and we put our raft on there because uh, we get really scared come uh, end, of, uh, or end of July, whether or not we're ever gonna get water again to float our boat. So uh, when the water's right, we put it on. And yes, yeah, so what we found was we went right after that water flow. Uh, see if I can find the data here, sorry. Current slide. So this is a comparison of 
2016 data and the 2018 data. So yeah, so 2016 was the first year we did our float. And you can see uh, in 2018, we caught uh, quite a bit fewer Mount Whitefish in sites four to 13. And we did sites four to 13 right after that high water event. Uh, and when we, we go and look at and we break it down to mature Mount Whitefish and immature, the difference we see was in the immature Mount Whitefish. So small whitefish that you would expect um, would be so in high water events, we typically see really small whitefish actually moving up into the tributaries to avoid the high water velocities. Uh, so we think that's that's potentially what would have happened there. Uh, we have similar data, not just with mountain whitefish, uh, but um, brook trout and, uh, and all the other small fish. So we hardly caught any things, any uh, pearl dace, things like that. Um, the folks in, in Grand Prairie were sampling the Kakwa River during a similar time period, because we had all that high water, they had all the high water at the same time as us, and, and they seen the, the same thing with their catch rates of Mount Whitefish, where they were quite depressed right after that, that high, high water flow. Thank you. Yep. Mike, I'm, I'm curious to see, to know if you, you're seeing an increase in brook trout numbers in the, in the river. Uh, no. Um, I will share that too. I think I have that. So what we're seeing with uh, brook trout is, I just gotta kill this. Uh, is they're, they're staying very similar. Crap, sorry, sorry guys. Share. Brook trout. Trout. So these are plots from uh, our, our reports that are getting generated. So all this is showing this one here. So this is our sampling angling. Uh, so 2014, our catch rates range from zero to three. And in 2018, they range from zero to two. Uh, this is spread out a bit, but the mean is about the same. So uh, catch rates for angling for brook trout stayed about the same. Uh, when we look at our backpack data, like when you look at these data, each one of these little dots is, is showing a site and how many fish were caught at that site. So in 2014, our catch rates were varied from zero to eight per site. Uh, in 2018, they were zero to almost six. Uh, but similarly, that when, when I look at this plot, they, they're basically the same in my mind. Uh, when you look at, and this is just the distribution, the size distribution, this is just a count on the side here. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a catch rate, uh, but it gives you an idea of kind of what the size distribution is. And this, this includes fish that we caught sampled uh, with uh, angling, backpack, and float. Yeah, and majority of the fish brook trout we're seeing are smaller fish that we're catching with the backpack. Uh, there's some in the main stem, not a lot, um, but they're, they're kicking close to 40 centimeters, some of the bigger ones. But yeah, it, they're not really, so although we identified brook trout as a potential driver of decline, I'm not saying it's not, um, I'm not saying it is. The jury's still out on that one. We'd have to do a little bit more work on that. Uh, if we do any kind of um, uh, remote site incubation or moving small fish into the upper portions where most of the brook trout are. Uh, but when I look at these data, things like um, this backpack data, we're talking in some of the great or the higher densities of eight fish per 300 meters of electrofishing. Um, those aren't really, really high densities. When we talk about um, a high density, say rainbow trout fishery, our, our upper ones we're talking in Tri Creeks, we're talking like 100 fish per 300 meters. So although we say brook trout are established in there, they are, uh, they're, they're not really, really high densities. So, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious as to these, I, I'm, these data are, are kind of interesting to me because we're seeing increases in most fish. Um, we're not seeing increases in brook trout. And I'm not sure why that is. But having said that, we're still looking at only two data points uh, for most of these data. So <laughs> it, it's, it's really easy to draw a trend between two lines right now. Uh, and it doesn't really mean anything until you, you get the third and fourth, so. I guess to expand on that, how's the, how are the bull trout doing? Ah. <laughs> uh, bull trout are, are pretty sparse still. 
Um, yeah. We're still looking at, for the most part, our, our sample angling. Uh, we're detecting them uh, pretty similar from 2018 and 2014. Um, the backpack stuff, we're, we're, it, they're, the catch rates are still the same. They're still less than one. I think one site here, there was three. Um, what I have noticed uh, observationally with bull trout are that um, in 2014 and 2016, we, we weren't seeing any bull trout in the main stem. And 2018 and 2019, we've, we've been catching adult bull trout. So I'm talking 50 and 60 centimeter bull trout along the trunk road. And we, we never used to see them there before. Um, uh, I don't, I, I could, I could hazard a guess, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's cool. I, I observed them there. I suspect if we were still angling up there, we may not have observed them because they're pretty easy to catch. And I'm not saying people are poaching them, but um, if they get hooked a few times, they're, they're probably less likely to hang around or, or perhaps um, fall on the wayside. But uh, uh other observation I noticed as well along the just downstream of the Sundance Road. So downstream of the Sundance Road, historically we've seen uh, congregations of whitefish and grayling in 2016. We weren't seeing grayling there anymore. Uh, very few. Uh, 2019, sorry, 2018, we were seeing uh, grayling going there again. And we were actually catching legal pike just below there around the corner in the pool uh, in the tail out. I'm assuming they're hanging out eating whitefish and grayling, uh, but not just one or two. Like we were sitting there catching pike after pike after pike. And as you guys know, there's campsite at uh, Sundance. So uh, that seems to be a bit of an indication of, of less angling pressure too, because people, those were all legal pike and people could illegally harvested those. Um, we're not seeing a ton of uh, uh, folks actually at the Sundance crossing uh, as like we used to with regards to camping and, and angling. So it's not even one of the places where we're seeing a lot of non-compliance, which is surprising because it's probably one of the better places you could target a fish real quick below that bridge crossing. So I'm, I'm seeing positives. Um, I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, I, I'm, kind of surprised that uh, uh, some of the, the data at how good some of it might be. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think we're doing the right thing so far. Do I want to keep it closed all the time? <laughs> Hell no. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, if we've come this far, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to uh, sacrifice a few more years if we need to, to, to get this one head, uh, its head above the water. Thanks. Yep. Okay, well, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, Mike, thanks very much for a fantastic There was a, a lot of information there. Just a sec, Root. I'm going to mute everybody again. There's a lot of information there. Uh, it was good for me actually to see the refresh on the, uh, the mountain whitefish data as well. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for putting that all together. We look forward to uh, uh, working with you over the next, uh, well, the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully all the, uh, the stars line up and we'll be able to get out there and do some uh, angling yeah, and possibly some electrofishing. Yeah, so I, uh, that, yeah, that's one thing to remind everyone that, uh, so we will be looking for folks to come help us out in Dismal Creek again. Uh, if you guys are ready, willing, and able, uh, we, we greatly appreciate any, of the, any help we could get with regards to angling or, or anything else that uh, you guys are, you guys want to want to do. Um, one of the things uh, I want to remind you too is, Although we, we say, hey, let, let's go fishing in Dismal. I know everyone wants to go fishing in Dismal because we can catch fish there. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not excluding you guys from fishing the main stem Pemina either. Uh, it's just a little bit, uh, 
if, if anyone wants to help me on the payment of that, that's perfectly fine as well. It just means you walk three kilometers and catch one fish or two fish or three fish. And then every once in a while you get surprised. And that, those are the, the, those are actually the fun days. I prefer the days on the Pamina to dismal. Dismal are really fun. Um, but when we find, find new and more fish in the Pamina, those are, those are the, the glory days for me. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's, there's opportunity there as well. And I'm just looking at the chat here, uh, Ken. It looks like Ryan is on the call, but he couldn't have his mic. And, and he said that uh, we collected sediment samples in the small streams in 2018. So with regards to the question on whirling disease, uh, all the sediment samples came back as negative. So um, what whirling disease was doing in their sediment samples, they were looking for um, the worms that would be transmitting the spores and stuff with regards to whirling disease. And I now that I have a recollection that we did I, I think we actually did provide fish for um, for whirling disease uh, during the the first the first big blitz on hey whirling disease has come we need to check everything uh, I seem to recall that we might have let them go in there and sacrifice some brook trout so that might be why we're having that's now that I look back and I, I'm gonna have to go confirm that but maybe that's why brook trout's the only one that we're not seeing an increase on. Hey Mike, are you just looking for like a, who are you getting to volunteer to like, um, can like if I had time off, it's. No it's... guys from BC, sorry. <laughs> Too much COVID. No. <laughs> yeah, no, we're looking uh, like folks like you would, would, would be easy sell because like we trained you. So we, we know you're not horrible. No, um, like, and, and I, like I got folks uh, asking me from uh, hack crews here working fires if they could come. So, as long as uh, there's one of us able to go out and and collect the data in the standard fashion and and we're covered under the uh, the research permit so uh, the only thing is to make sure that whoever's volunteering is has some sort of safety plan that we could show our safety officer saying that uh, you're looking after yourself you're uh, phoning your mom or your granny in there making sure you get home alive that's all yeah and that's the same with us we put together yep. a safety plan uh, last year and uh, our volunteers, we don't just go willy-nilly in the field. We're actually uh, heading out with uh, some of the trained, well, some of the folks from AEP. Cool. All righty. Fantastic, Ted. Mike. I will uh, process this video and get it, uh, get it posted and made uh, available for, uh, for others. This is awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.